the, the we have a dish called mansaf and it definitely takes the place for our top traditional cultural food. The search for knowledge starts now. Um, basically, mansaf, for anyone who might not be familiar with it, is rice. Um, the, the color of the rice is yellow due to adding um, a spice. We call it in Arabic za'faran. I think maybe it's saffron in English. I think so. Um, so that adds a beautiful yellow color to the rice. And then we add lamb pieces of meat basically and then there is a some sort of i think we would say sauce that consists of i mean it's technically yogurt but it's yogurt mixed with the the meat's broth and some spices are added to it and it's just the best thing you could the best jordanian food you could possibly eat you know um and i think Mansaf is so much more than just, you know, rice and lamb and jamid, which is the yogurt um, or the sauce. Uh, mansaf is when the family, normally mansaf, you know, I mean, when my mom cooks mansaf or my dad as well cooks mansaf, I'm really good mansaf, by the way, um, we need to have the family at home. All my family members need to be at home. Um, we all gather around on one table. We all sit together. Um, mansaf is so much more than just, you know, a food. It's it's the gathering of a family around one table, having conversations, talking about our days, our weeks, um, our hectic lives, just any of that, you know. Yeah. Mansaf can't be just, you know, a quick pick-me-up um, snack or maybe a light meal. And because of the all the nutritional things in mansaf, normally after mansaf you would need to sleep because it's very heavy on our stomachs, you know. Um, and mansaf isn't, I mean, for my person, like personally, for my family, mansaf is, you know, the gathering of all of us, you know, my siblings and I, my, my parents, just maybe my aunts, my uncles, everyone, gathering around on one table and having it. But for other Jordanian families or just in our Jordanian culture, mansaf is normally, it's made um, when there's gatherings, um, normally huge amounts of people because mansaf is almost universal, you know. There is no Jordanian that doesn't like mansaf. I mean, you could find, you know, a, bit, a few, <laughs> but the, the, the great majority do enjoy eating mansaf. And so mansaf is had at gatherings, it's, ha it's um, in weddings, you know, the food would be mansaf at weddings, um, at funerals as well. We actually have this sort of tradition where, um, I'm not sure if it's religious or if it's cultural, I think it's more cultural, um, that uh, basically we hold our funerals for three days. And for each of the three days, um, the family who's hosting the funeral, you know, the, the family who lost their loved one, don't cook anything. Because, you know, they're grieving, they're mourning, they're lost, they're going through something. It's like that in the U.S. Yeah, so instead, I mean, I think um, it's pretty universal, you know, so... You know, when the family is mourning, they don't want to tire themselves physically. They're already tired mentally and, you know, emotionally. Uh, in Jordan, in general, fast food is something very prominent over here. And it's, it's, I mean, I feel like Jordanians are just obsessed with fast food and having junk food and all of that. Because the amount of restaurants, especially here in Amman, is actually alarming. There's just so many restaurants. Uh, there's certain streets, certain areas that are just filled with restaurants. F like from the beginning of the street to the very end of the street, it's just restaurants, food, food, food. Um, I think maybe um, it's... We don't really do Mexican fast food over here. It's mostly either Arab fast food, like shawarma, um, maybe grilled uh, grills, like just in general, grilled lamb, grilled chicken, just all of that. Maybe as well, just normal American, like fried f fast food, you know, so McDonald's, KFC, just any sort of fried chicken, um, like let's say restaurant. It's really widespread over here, I would say. You tend to see that the poor, in regards to their diet, they don't eat meat, they don't eat chicken, they cannot afford it. Um, they don't eat fish either. They can eat canned fish, um, like they're sold almost in this size. It's really small canned fish, and um, that's just what they eat with rice, or they do that um, 
as in mensaf let's say they add the fish to rice and they add the you know people just tend to navigate around whatever is whatever they're going through financially and they just try to stay as close to our Jordanian culture as they possibly can be but because our food is so filled with meat chicken fish you know just things that are nowadays I mean in Jordan in general expensive or they just can't afford it maybe they're not expensive but maybe they're below the line of let's say the bar of poor you know so they just can't afford it and so their diets would be very much different to our diets they would consist of maybe bread just bread like just bread not no cheese no chocolate spreads no nothing bread maybe if they're lucky enough um if let's say organizations um work with them or they provide for them then then they'll eat rice maybe every two months um they just I mean, I can't imagine what they live like because it's very hard. Whereas the rich, let's say, they'll have meat or chicken maybe every day or every other day, let's say. Um, they can afford to go and eat out. I mean, even fast food here is a luxury because the, let's say, things you would consider to be cheap. So let's say, for example, just random fast food chains, let's say McDonald's, KFC. It's expensive for the poor as well. You know, there is no dollar menu. There is no... We don't have that over here. So even the fast foods that you would, you know, you would expect to be more affordable or more easy on the pocket, they can't afford it. So even fast food is a luxury over here. You know, if you can eat out, if you can go to a restaurant, even fancy restaurants, they they probably have never been to even a building that has a fancy restaurant because they can't afford it. You know, it's just not something that they can do. The majority of the social platforms that we are on um, consists of Snapchat, Instagram, um, WhatsApp for communication, mainly like class groups, um, teacher, student um, interaction is also on WhatsApp, um, maybe family groups, WhatsApp as well. Um, but the greater majority of us use Snapchat mostly, I would say. I know people who don't show their face on social media. I know people that are greatly impacted by what goes on on social media. So I would say some of my friends have, definitely have, um, you know, just self-image issues because they compare themselves to models on Instagram, let's say, or social media figures who use filters, um, just all that, you know, sort of stuff. It's really, it's the same here as it's back in the US, you know, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, and not everyone can afford to go to private schools. In public schools, English is just neglected, um, especially since our high school systems for public schools are in Arabic. And so English is just a subject for them, you know, you know, and it's it's vice versa as well. So for me personally, I'm in a private high school and in private high schools, um, or at least the system I'm in, which is a British system, uh, English is more important than Arabic. I take one Arabic lesson a week and all the rest of my studies are in English. I express myself better in English. I'm able to speak it very well. I read many books in English. I listen to songs in English. I listen to podcasts in English. Not that Arabic is any less, but it's because it's easier for me to understand, to take in, to, to just, you know, it's the way my mind works. So when I, when I first came to Amman and I spoke to my friends in English, they all called me spoiled. They all called me, you know, you think you're better than all of us. Even though we were all in private schools, we were all coming from similar, you know, families of similar classes in society, you know, regarding wealth, regarding social status, all of that, you know. We were all very much similar. So it seemed very very wrong of them to accuse me of that when we're all the same you know I developed this sort of insecurity in my Arabic language because I felt as if um you know because when I first came here I got bullied for speaking English English so much I kind of developed an insecurity well what if my Arabic isn't good enough or what if I do seem spoiled so let me just stick to English either way you know because I'm I'm not I'm not as strong at Arabic as I am in English I think yes, like most jobs nowadays in Jordan require you to speak English and Arabic because 
I mean, in different sectors, they mostly do, you know, speak in English and they do work in English and they type out things in English. And so you need to have some sort of English, you know, um, let's say certificate or English speaking. Uh, you know, you just need to be English speaking to actually reach somewhere. And if you don't, then they'll always be like, oh, well, you can't speak English. That's why they're be doing better than you. Or that's why they reached a better status or a better position than you. So here it's it's definitely something to strong arm yourself with. Mm -hmm. There's a third. Yes, I think um, day to day life, maybe um, thoughts, let's say mental health, it's all in English for me. I just don't know how to think of these things in Arabic. I don't have the terminology. I haven't read enough things to have that sort of mindset, you know, to think in Arabic, but. Um, one of the things I definitely cannot think about unless it's in Arabic is religion you know I think it's because um, the Quran I study is in Arabic and um, I mean the, the language it's translated to is in Arabic um, and I think because I pray to God in Arabic sometimes I'll, I'll use English as well sometimes you'll be like okay I cannot say this in Arabic so I'm going to say it in English <laughs> you know um, so I think it's just religion that I think of in Arabic this. Now there is secret dating, um, which in some family families leads to honor killing, which is something quite widespread over here in Jordan. Really? Yeah, it is. Um, so honor killing is when the family, you know, normally a strict conservative, religious, mostly Muslim family, finds out that their daughter is dating, or their daughter is in love, or their daughter, let's say, doesn't want to marry the person they've chosen for her because there's someone else behind the scenes um the father would end up killing his own daughter and i wouldn't say that it happens you know very often it'll happen one once maybe a year or once a year we'll hear about it you know maybe it happens but it's they they just cover over it because here the public will just you know, be furious, will go to the streets, will protest that this is not right. You know, honor killing should not be a thing. Um, we, It's not anything religious. It's not anything, um, you know, we're not obligated to do it. You know, your daughter is secretly dating. Okay, sit her down, understand, talk to her, understand why she's secretly dating. She's secretly dating because she knows that you as a father or you as a mother or you as a brother or, or, or you as a family, you know, wouldn't accept her falling in love, wouldn't accept her, you know, um, meeting her person, you wouldn't accept that. So she has to go to secret dating for her to, to be happy, you know, and I think it's just, it's a very ugly thing. But also, um, I would say as of recently, more families have become open-minded, you know, they, they allow their daughters to date around the age of marriage, um, they, and this is also special cases, because not all families would permit that. Um, and there's also families who are, I would say, of the newer generation who just allow their daughters to date. You know, you want to date, go ahead and date. I mean, even if it's not obligated in our culture, uh, if it's not allowed or permitted in our culture, they'll still go ahead and do it. You know, they don't really care about that sort of thing. You know, so it really depends on the family um, and how they feel about dating. For the majority of women in general, so they'll finish high school, and if they come from an educated, um, rich family most of the time then they'll continue to university or college and then after that if their parents are open-minded if their family is you know um accepting or if even if they're in need of financial aid then they'll allow their daughter to work but working eventually needs to stop because you i mean it's something in our culture which i absolutely hate and i do not agree with um it's that at the end of the day you're a woman you have uh, certain things that are required from you as a woman to do. You need to bear children. You need to be a faithful, um, let's say, wife. You need to stay at home, care for your home. You know, your place is in your home. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't really agree with that, but I mean, this isn't really on what I think. You know what I mean? So I'm not really going to go into that. But definitely, at one point, there is, um, you know, just you know being a woman and having your career or making your own money does eventually crash but um 
from what I've seen, you know, whether it's cousins, friends, family friends even, I see that the newer generation is more accepting of having wives or having, you know, just women in the family working and making their money and continuing their studies. Um, that includes continuing to study abroad. That, continue, that also includes um, a woman opening her own business under her own name, you know what I mean? Which is also something new because that wasn't a thing. Um, if a woman wanted to own a business, then she would have to have it underneath the name of her husband or her father or her brother even you know she wouldn't have it in her own name I'm not really sure what's the reason for that maybe not I suspect or I think that maybe it's to not give the woman too much power or too much control over you know her situation and something that I also now that I've brought it up is very important um is that being you know working or having a career means that you're strong means that you, to some extent, are independent, which means, to most men at least in the Jordanian culture, they think as a threat that, oh, okay, so she has money, she has a career, she's all sorted out for herself. If I harm her, if I hurt her, if I do anything, she at any point in, in her life can eventually choose to leave because she has you know, free will, she can leave, she's not dependent financially on him. She doesn't, I mean, the only thing stopping her then would be culture you know, to leave a relationship or let's say get out of something toxic or just any of that, you know. But um, I feel like companies here as well are becoming more considerate of working mothers, working women. You know, they'll make sure that the time hours, you know, the whenever they start, whenever they finish is suitable for them. Um, but that's also very rare because most companies, you know, they think that, oh, okay, since you want to be equal to men and since you want to be working, then you'll have to, you know, still deal with work and still come to work whenever we choose to because you want to be treated this way. You want to be equal. So there you have it. Be equal. So I think that Americans, something that they misconceive about Arabs is that we're all Muslims. Um, you know, we are not all Muslims. There are multiple religions in the Arab world, let's say. Um, <laughs> and going into religion, we're not terrorists. That's not us. That's something completely different to who we are. Um, so we are not terrorists either. Um, Arabs do not live in complete luxury. We do not ride, um, you know, cars painted with gold and we don't own diamonds and, you know, crazy amounts. Like, no, you know, most of us are, um, you know, middle class, we work, we maybe if we're lucky enough, we'll have our own business, you know, that's just the way we're not all really well off, you know what I mean? But also, we're not all poor. We don't drive on camels, that's not the thing anymore. We have roads, we have cars, uh, we have Teslas, Mercedes, um, just any sort of car that you would have, we have it here too. Um, so I think that's also something that Americans might misconceive about Arabs. Um, and the fact that we're not all conservative we're not not that that's a bad thing but we don't any sort of image that you might have on you know just conservative families conservative religions just all of that then it's most probably very much um ex you know it's to the extreme and that's because of media and the way they paint us and i think for arabs you know some things we must conceive about Americans. Now, I, obviously, I'm not an American, but from what I know, is that in general, Arabs think that, you know, Americans live the dream life or the uh, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, that Americans uh, all live in very big houses, mansions, and they're well off, you know, um, and that uh, maybe living in America is better than living where wherever you are, and that... America is the land of opportunities and the land, you know, I really think that that also is ext extremized, I would say, it's to the extreme, because that's not really the reality of things, you know, there's also people who are struggling to live in America, there is a huge, um, you know, population of homeless people, um, and in general, most of people living in America don't live the American dream, you know, they're not, uh, let's say, equal to others in society, they're not, you know, anything that we think exists in America is probably also wrong and very much extremized by the media as well, you know, so I think, and there's a lot of things in general, you know, between both, let's say, worlds that are also wrong and, you know, we all, I mean, both sides believe to be true but are completely false and they're over exaggerated and all that sort of things by the media. <laughs>
can I find knowledge? Yeah, I think I edged out mob front. Across the river and into the trees. Salam alaikum. I think I edged out mob front. والجهل والشر أعمل منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعلمون خبير Knowledge is power Power provides information Information leads to education Education leads wisdom Wisdom is liberation People are not liberated because of lack of knowledge Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum as-salam Since you seek knowledge, I'll reveal it to you Follow me.